I would like to welcome you. My name is Patty Christensen, and I am, um, I have actually such a great job. I am a professional storyteller, which uh, my mom always says, that means they pay you money to tell stories. <laughs> and I say, yes, they do. And isn't, isn't that a great job? So I have um, the lucky job this morning of taking you guys on a little whirlwind tour of how one can use storytelling as a tool in working with um, adult one-on-one -on -one tutoring, um, small group or classes for ESL or a basic adult education, and families for literacy. So there is so much to do, and I'm going to, um, you, you have some handouts in front of you, and I, I'm not going to read handouts to you, but I'm going to uh, point out a couple of things as we go on. But before we get started, I want to just ask you a quick piece. Anybody have any ideas or opinions? Why in the world might we use storytelling as a tool for literacy? So if you raise your hand and kind of just shout out loudly so everyone can hear, but why do you think storytelling might be a useful literacy tool? We learn, we learn and, and remember from stories more than anything else, in my opinion. Stories, there's something that seems to be about how people are that, boy, you give them a lecture, they're not so sure, but you tell them a story. And any of you ever uh, heard a sermon that you can't quite remember the message, but boy, that story was excellent there in the middle. So I, I think that's, that's really good. Uh, somebody else over here. Yes. You have a chance to use your imagination. Using your imagination is a huge piece in storytelling. And we know one of the things in the whole process of literacy is being able to take it from the written word and make the pictures in our brains. And storytelling is something that really helps with that. Who else? Yes. It's fun. Oh my goodness, it's fun. Well, those of you who do work in the school know we're no longer able to say we can do something because it's fun. There has to be a theoretical foundation behind it. But the fact is, it is fun. There's, frankly, and I, and I think, you know, people who are tutors and people who are learners know some things about literacy is not very fun. Decoding, not fun. Sounding out new things that you don't know. Memorizing grammar rules. We need it. Not that fun when you say, now we're going to move to storytelling. Sounds like, OK, that might be fun. So excellent, very good point. Anybody else have something that, yes? Connecting new words to concepts in the story. <laughs> New words to concept. Storytelling is one of the best ways to be able to, you're using words, new vocabulary in a context. So even if you don't know the word, as it goes on, you're like, oh, they must be talking about that thing that farmers use when they're doing the planting deal, even if you don't know what that thing is. So it's a, it's a great way to build vocabulary without, you know, kill and drill, looking up words. Anybody else have, have something? I, I just wanna, want to uh, point out to you, and good, good for you guys, even though you're in literacy, you didn't just read me back the handout. But um, we, we, did have, uh, we did have a group of professionals a while ago um, take a shot at why tell stories and literacy programs. And I will just um, make a note that you have that handout and uh, take it home and memorize this handout. Uh, and, I, and I say that in part because sometimes we do have to defend some of the techniques that we use. And, and there's a problem with things that are too fun that people go, well, it must not be serious. So there, there are some good serious um, reasons why we can use storytelling as a literacy tool. And um, sometimes for this workshop, I, I use as a subtitle, Hearing and Telling Stories, The Connection to Reading, Writing, and Speaking. And so just keep that in, in the back of your mind as we're going through here today. Now, the main 
nuts and bolts of this workshop are going to be on um, the, the second main handout sheet that's called Tried and True Storytelling Tricks and Techniques for the Classroom or One-on-One -on -one Teaching. So that's page three in your handout. Just so you know, for, for those of you who like to hear and see at the same time, I'm going to kind of take us through this. I come from a family of educators. My sister is a long-term second grade teacher. And what she tells me is, anytime you are talking with teachers and tutors, do not give them a bunch of theories. Give them something that they can use next week in their class, with their learners, something that's really hands-on. So this is kind of my uh, top 10 or top 11 best things that I have used. Um, let me just tell you just another minute. I told you I was a professional storyteller. I didn't tell you. I worked for several years as the Families for Literacy coordinator and as a, a, a storyteller and dramatic um, teacher on staff with the Escondido Public Library Literacy Program. So I've spent a lot of hands-on time in literacy programs. And so a lot, of, a lot of this information was developed there, as well as I also do a lot of work in um, the, the schools from preschool on through university level using this. So this is the stuff that I actually use. It's not the, like, I read it in a book someplace. So are you guys ready? Yes. OK. Very first thing, I want to give you a quick experience. The difference between story reading and story telling. So I, um, one, one of the projects that I have been working on uh, this year is I've taken a story that I tell actually with a storytelling partner, James Nelson Lucas, one of our favorite oral stories that we've told often. And we're um, making a picture book out of it, which is one of those things that can happen, the connection between a story told out loud and reading. But I'm going to, because this is a good short story, and because I wrote it, there's no copyright problems, um, I'm going to give you a quick experience. I want you to imagine that you are either my learner or that we're in a class together, and I'm going to give you just the opportunity to listen to this story. So you don't have to take notes on this part, just Listen, I'm going to read you a little part of it, and then I'm going to put the book down and um, tell you it. So the title of this story is called Baby Coyote. And just, just so you know, we're, we're uh, waiting for the illustrator to bring the color version. So not quite as interesting, but just, just so you know, this, this is an original story. Um, Baby Coyote is told by Patty Christensen and James Nelson Lucas. And so, of course, I would walk the cover of the book so everybody gets the chance and you know someone's going to say, I didn't see it over here, so I'll, I'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll walk it around. This story begins once. A long, long time ago, there was a gathering of animals in the desert. People are already, I can't see the pictures, that's okay. <laughs> they were kind of like wolves, but they were not wolves. They were kind of like dogs, but they were not dogs. They were coyotes, and they came from the mountains, from the city, from the countryside, from the river valleys, from the seashores. They came from everywhere. And I will, will tell you, the illustrations rock, but I'm now going to set this aside <laughs> and continue on with the story so you know. All those coyotes got together for a coyote convention. Now, at a coyote convention,
convention they all love to get together. Well, and party. We're going to party. We're going to pa Well, wait a minute. If we're going to have a party and a coyote convention, we should have a contest. Contest is a great idea. Um, well, let me see. What kind of contest? We could have, we could have a pie-eating contest. Oh, no, I get blueberry in my whiskers, not so good. We could, have, we could have a jumping contest. No, Brother Rabbit's better at jumping. Let me see, what are coyotes really? I know, we could have a howling contest. Don't you think that's a good idea to have a howling contest? Yes, let's have a howling contest. So everybody, all the coyotes began to practice their howling. Well, some practice with their brother or sister. Oh! And, and some just practice alone. Oh! Some of them said, secret is nose to the moon. Oh! And some of them said, it's all in the tail action. <laughs> well, every coyote was practicing. Everyone, that is, except for the baby coyote. And he wasn't practicing. He was over in the corner and he was crying. <laughs> well, one of his friends was so worried, went over and got his grandma, who came and said, Baby coyote, why are you not practicing? Why are you not howling? The contest is starting. Maybe Kat said, because I don't even know how to howl. <laughs> well, the grandma said, well, you're pretty good at whining, <laughs> but I know just how you can be the best howler. The best howler? How could I be the best howler? I don't know how. Well, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go into the desert and find a plant. It's the biggest, tallest, prickliest, spiniest plant in all the desert, a cactus. And when you find it, I want you to stand in front of it, and I want you to put your arms out wide. Stand, arms? I'm a coyote. I don't even have thumbs. <laughs> okay, how about your paws? Put your paws. Okay, can you guys help put your paws out wide? Would you put your paws out wide? And then I want you to make your mouth little, really little. <laughs> And I want you to give that big old cactus a big old hug and a kiss. And when he did that, what sound do you think he made? Ow! And that's how the baby coyote won first prize in the howling contest. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so look for that book at uh, bookstores near you. But, but okay, so. Let's just take a minute, and I want you to reflect on the difference that you had as a listener between when I was reading you and walking around the book and when I was telling the story out loud orally. So just raise your hand with some reflections. How was that experience different? Yes. You, uh, in the second part, you were more interactive with the listener. Mm-hmm. Excellent. What else? We had to really use our imagination because we didn't see any pictures in the book now. Excellent. The, the pictures had to be in your own head because I was not giving you the pictures. Yes. Maybe it was said, but you're free to use uh, hand gestures and body gestures, which uh, also adds to the experience. It, it does. Now, some people, and especially like some children's librarians are amazing book handlers. They can handle and stand on their head kind of at, at the same time. For me, I always get scared I'm losing my place if, if I get too far away from, from the page. What else, what else did you notice? Yes. You were all involved. Everyone was involved. And, you know, and of course, there was, there was an extra tricky part about, okay, put your arms out and we're all going to howl there together. But it, it is, was definitely that there was a place of bringing some audience participation. Yes? The props make it more exciting. You know, we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. I am a big fan of props. And ask my husband. We have a garage full of props. But, and... Um, one of, the, one of the things we didn't say in the, the why you storytelling, a big plug 
If you are working with English language learners who have limited vocabulary, props rock. <laughs> it is such a happy, happy thing. You're not sure what it is, but all of a sudden you have this goofy little tail that I put on. And even if you didn't know for sure what a coyote was, you know, that, that might not be a word that they have in your culture, seeing that little tail was both fun and it gave you another clue about what that might be. Yes? Sound effects. Sound effects. Sound effects, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Sound effects are fun. Kids like sound effects. Grown-ups love sound effects. I, and I, I, I thought, oh, I, I, when I was first learning storytelling, I was embarrassed. I thought, no, I, I will never ask adults. You know what? Adults are great at, at uh, sound effects. Um, yes? Oh, I was going to say, the story moves along so much better than when you're just, there's no book between you. And nobody worries that they can't see the picture. Huh? Excellent. Right there. There is, and especially, you know, and many, uh, I'm going to be later on this afternoon doing a workshop about using picture books. Um, the, my, my sister always says, now, make sure to clarify for people you're not saying don't read books, because that's not what I'm saying at all. But there are times when the book literally is between you, and especially if you have a smaller, larger group, Many of, many of our picture books really are good, you know, for one-on-one -on -one together where you can both see it. But if you have to walk the book around, and um, one, of my, one of my fifth grade teacher friends always says, there is nothing like when you're walking a book around and you bring it over here. Those boys who are over here know you cannot see them. <laughs> they know it. And you know, good opportunity to punch somebody, pop somebody. And it's disappointing if part of the really important thing is the picture and you didn't see the picture. You feel kind of ripped off a little bit like. Yeah, yeah like everybody, and everyone's laughing like, what, 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 I didn't see it. But then you have to like walk it back over. Yes. We were able to um, remember the details that were, when you acted it out more than when you read it. More details you can remember. You know, it gives some of that kinesthetic piece. And, and there is, it's just, um, you know, sometimes some of the pieces we do, we say, you know, bringing stories to life. And there is something, you know, watching, watching I wish you guys could have all seen you go, oh. You know, it's it's very fun. It seems to me that if you are, are acting and using a dramatic uh, vocal variety, that can help the, uh, the, the learners relax a little bit and not feel so uptight in a in a learning environment that you have given them subtle permission to do the same thing. Uh, ab absolutely. You know, sometimes. I think the information and the impression that we give our learners, this is so serious, and, <laughs> which doesn't make me learn better. I don't know, oh my gosh, it's serious. What if I make a mistake? But obviously, you know, if you're doing goofy things like that, it does go, like, oh, okay, this could be fun or funny with, without it being so much pressure. So I think that's, that's a very good point. I like to do that little demonstration just particularly for some reason, um, you know, and probably because of, of the media society and things we, we go in for now. Um, we've kind of gotten away from just sitting and telling a story often. Did, uh, raise your hand if you grew up in your family with anybody who told stories, not read them out of a book, but told stories. Story. Who, who in your family told stories? My brother was the best. And what, what did he do? Uh, he could put you there in the room <laughs> as it happened. Okay. And you were right there beside him in every movement, every remark, every, oh, and then he said, and he took him around, and there were 400 people, well, maybe three. <laughs> <laughs> but he could reel you in. And sometimes it was just an excuse to get out doing the dishes. <laughs> well, 
one, you know, and we, we can all and use it. Tell the story as it was going out the back door. <laughs> Get very quiet. <laughs> and my mother would go, Gary? No, <laughs> gone. Excellent. Who here had a, a storyteller in their life growing up? Who else? Yes. My father. And every night before bed, he would tell me a story about um, good Jessica and evil Jessica. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, but they were so descriptive. I mean, and, and neither of the little Jessicas looked like me, but um, uh, I was somewhere in between them. But um, I mean, they were so descriptive, and and little uh, evil Jessica bit her nails, and, and he, would, he would get so descriptive. I would just, I would wake me up even more because I would just think, more story! And I want to know more about evil Jessica. <laughs> But, uh, but no, it was just, it was engaging. It was always engaging. Excellent. And here's, here's just a little piece that I, that I want to throw in. We, and, uh, you know, I, I know, especially with my Families for Literacy people, often we would do working with them about reading books with your kids. You know, I've, we say every month, read books with your kids, read books with your kids, read books with your kids. Very important. As a struggling reader, though, you're like, here, <laughs> do this really hard thing with your kids late at night when you're both tired. They're like, oh, I should do that. That would be really good for my kid. But stories about evil Jessica, you don't have to read that out of a book. Just to be able to have some permission, you can just make that up. So I want to toss that in just as a little piece of encouragement that oftentimes people who are struggling readers did not occur to them that they have an additional resource besides being able to read to their children they can tell stories both making up stories relating true life stories um, I often tell adult learners there is nothing to get kids attention like starting, when I was your age, oh, yeah. you think, ooh, this might be good. <laughs> or when your uncle was my age, and you think that's probably even going to be better, because that might be some of the bad things that happen going on there. So just as a piece of encouragement, and sometimes you'll say, oh, you know, nothing very interesting happened to me. Oh, your life is interesting to kids and grandkids. They like knowing like, like times you got in trouble. Very interesting. So just uh, I appreciate it. And we probably could have many other people share about people telling the stories that are growing up. So just to toss that in there, people still want to hear stories. And um, I was just at a senior center a couple weeks ago. And one of the things they said is, you know, even though, one lady said, even though I'm 77 years old, I still like people to tell me stories. And, you know, who here likes somebody to tell them a story? Yeah, because it's cool. All right, we got, we got to keep moving on the, the tried and true tricks here because I, I want to get you through all of them. Um, I, want, I want to do another just little quick demonstration. Um, uh, Number two, which means we have to move really fast, but raise your hand if you have heard of Flat Stanley. Okay, so some of you have. If you have not, it is time you have heard of Flat Stanley. Flat Stanley is a phenomenon. I'm going to read you a little opening of uh, this book, Flat Stanley, to demonstrate this is, a, this is a very easy little technique you can do with a class or one-on-one. -on -one. But I'm going to ask you to listen to this with your eyes closed, making the picture in your head. Breakfast was ready. I will go wake the boys, Mrs. Lambchop said to her husband, George Lambchop. Just then, their younger son, Arthur, called from the bedroom he shared with his brother, Stanley. Hey, come here and look. 
Look, look, he pointed to Stanley's bed. Across it lay the enormous bulletin board that Mr. Lambchop had given the boys a Christmas ago so they could pin up pictures and maps. It had fallen during the night on top of Stanley. But Stanley was not hurt. In fact, he would still be sleeping if he had not been woken by his brother's shout. What's going on here, he called cheerfully from beneath the enormous board. The parents hurried to lift it up. Heavens, said Mrs. Lambchop. Gosh, said Arthur. Stanley's flat. As a pancake, said Mr. Lambchop. Darndest thing I've seen. Let's all have breakfast, said Mrs. Lambchop. Then Stanley and I will go see Dr. Dan and hear what he has to say. Okay. Open your eyes back up. And I, without, without showing you any illustrations, I want to ask you, raise your hand and give me a, a, a little quick description of Mrs. Lambchop. What did she look like in your imagination? Mrs. Lambchop, as I was reading. Color was her hair, skinny, uh, fat. What, what did you get? Yes. She was plump with an apron on. Plump with an apron, okay. Mine was tall and thin with an apron. Tall and thin with an apron? Yes. And it was kind of rounded and fluffy, a little bit lamb looking. <laughs> oh. Lamb looking fluffy. What color hair did she have? Red. Okay, white, red. My, mine is like a dark with, a, with some streaks of gray. Uh, there we go. Give me a description. How flat was Stanley really? He was squished, but how flat? An inch. An inch. Anybody flatter? As a pancake. As a pancake. Thinking, how flat is a pancake? There, there we all kind of go. Okay. All right, I like to, to do this for people. Again, part of what we're trying to help learners do is get from the words to making the pictures in our brain. Now, one of, one of the disservices that we have done in our society to have so many things now come at us visually all the time with internet and TV and movies and even to some, some extent picture book is people don't have as much experience making their own pictures. So I might with, and I, I took this as just a little simple book and I tell you a little bit more about the phenomena, but if I showed you an illustration from the book of here's the the, the new version of what flat Stanley looks like and how flat is he really, you, then you know what the right answer is and it must look that way. And you didn't have to do any work for it because you just look at the picture. So a little trick if you have somebody who's working on that piece of you know, being able to visualize is sometimes just read and then have them describe the pictures back to you. In some ways, retelling in a sneaky way a little, a little piece. So you're looking for comprehension, but also about making the pictures. Now, just tell you, if you have not heard of Flat Stanley, this book has been around, gosh, I, I, wanna, I wanna say like 25 years, six, 64, is that even longer than that? Uh, it's been around, but <laughs> way before any of us were born. Okay, <laughs> but um, but somebody got an idea of bringing a brook to life, and they one of the one of the adventures that Flat Stanley has is he wants to go to California, but um, it's too expensive for a plane fare, so he has his mom fold him up in an envelope and mail him <laughs> to California. So. Teachers and literacy programs at various places have drawn their own flat Stanley and sent him on an adventure. So I originally received flat Stanley. My uh, nephew in Texas, his class did that. He mailed me flat Stanley. And then the idea is, the people there, did you, you got a flat Stanley? Take a picture with it, like in front of Disneyland <laughs> or front, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, flat Stanley has been to the Great Wall of China. Uh, he went to the Oscars a few years ago. He went to George W's inauguration. Uh, he's, he's been around the block. 
but this this um, is one of those pieces. So. If you're interested, go on the internet and look up Flat Stanley, and there are pictures of him all over the place. But but there is there is a, just another another way that um, hooks together geography and the story and how things go in a in a very fun kind of way. So just to toss that out, just because that's one of those things you ought to know. If you do not know about Flat Stanley, you ought to know about it. Okay, um, going to talk you through just a, a quick couple things. Let's act it out. We're not going to have time to do this today, but this works really well both in Families for Literacy and also in small adult groups about rather than always having to read, sometimes there might be either a story that you've read or a familiar story like Three Little Pigs that people know. And as part of your literacy program, to do something of acting it out with the teacher, the tutor, doing the narration. So low pressure on learners. We're going to be three pigs and you know one, two, three pigs and and you just direct them through but again it gives our kinesthetic learners a little bit more opportunity to act out. One of my favorite stories to act out is um, it's uh, one of those books again I've been on for a long time, Caps for Sale that great book about the guy who's selling caps with the curious monkeys. And good, good story, lots of interesting vocabulary with that. But one of my friend's moms found a pile of those kind of caps. And so there's nothing like, and I actually have 20 of them, which I didn't bring all along. But there's nothing like, in terms of for prop and a piece, Get somebody to be the caps for sale guy, and his only line is caps for sale. Okay, low pressure, you know, even whoever can do that and walk around with that. And then other, other participants get to be the curious monkeys and sneak the hats. So I just say that again as another opportunity. Sometimes, especially in those um, small groups or adult <coughs> classes, you think like, could we do something a little bit different? Again, sometimes people say, well, we have to do, it has to be people have to memorize scripts and things. Oh my gosh, does that sound fun? Ah, it sounds hard, but to say, we're just gonna do a little quick act out, very fun. Um, in terms of props, simple props, again, those hats, so good. I, I get a ton of mileage in a little uh, uh, foam rubber sword from Legoland that, you know, Lego has a lot of cool stuff, but you know that there's, sometimes there's something going on in a story that just a little extra prop could make a big difference on. And whether it's, um, was, was doing one story with the colonial time, and I happened to find this three-corner hat. And suddenly, it added just a little extra lightness to the session. It's like, OK, we're going to put on our goofy little colonial hats and take us back in time. Um, Mark Twain has, has a short story that um, he uh, wrote down, but also told orally many, many years ago that, I, that I've used with, it, with an adult learner that is called the Golden Arm. And I created a very lifelike, <laughs> totally lifelike, beautiful Golden Arm. Oh, okay, this is, this is an, you do not have to be an excellent sewer <laughs> to do this. But suddenly, that you know that gave another another little extra fun thing that that went along with that. <laughs> People like laughing at my sewing. Okay, um, I also and you can often pick these up at little museums, a little train whistle. <laughs> you know, there's there's a lot of books that have things like trains in them, and you know, again, sort of a gimmick. But it's a little bit fun, and it just adds something um, on a little bit. Some people love, you know, full-on costumes, and if, if you like that, that's good. A lot of people, uh, I am not going to do a full-on costume, but maybe sometime you might be willing to pull out 
a beautiful, fabulous gold. Oh, okay, so quick, tell me, what story could I tell? Rapunzel, Goldilocks, Rumpelstiltskin. It is, it is very beautiful. Cinderella. Many of our beautiful princess stories appear to have, have that. Suddenly we, we went from, we have no idea, to like, ooh, let's, let's start using our prediction skills. Like, hmm, I wonder what's, what's coming up, what's going on here. So again, you know, uh, Lady Godiva, it would depend on the glass. <laughs> That I, I don't have much call for that one, but it, you know, would would make a very interesting prop <laughs> to to go ahead and do that. So I I say those those props. Oh, one and actually I did not bring it with me today, but my coolest all time prop. There is um, a book, uh, a bilingual book of Latin American folk tales by Olga Loya, which I think is is actually. Um, on, on the featured book piece of Momentos Magicos, Magic Moments. But my all-time coolest favorite prop, there was a story in there, a Latin American folk tale. It was called The Rooster's Claw, a, a, a different version of, of the monkey's paw. And it was like, you know, watch out what you wish for kind of story. But I, I was working with a, a group in literacy and they were having a hard time kind of wrapping their brain around this story. But I went to El Tigre Market, got myself a little uh, package of chicken feet, uh, cooked them in the oven for like 175 degrees for like 10 hours till it all dried up. And then I suddenly, it went from la 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 story to this weird, icky, interesting looking prop that went with the story and the the cordero the healing woman brings out this rooster's foot and i will tell you my my learners are like <laughs> <laughs> that because suddenly it gave them a ten and people are like can i can i touch it <laughs> I, I don't i might want to i don't know if i should go out, go on so just just to you know, toss it, and sometimes you get, my, my husband was like, you have a very weird job, but <laughs> they said, there you go. Okay, we're, we're just going to zip through some of these pretty quick. Sound effects, so as we're talking. Their sound effects are one of the most easiest things to add in to a story. Um, you know, I, I'm just going to take you through a quick thing. If I said, it was, it was a really windy, windy night. Let's hear some wind sounds. And then um, suddenly the ocean waves were crashing on the shore. And then you could hear a baby crying. <laughs> Not to be confused with a bunch of cats. <laughs> Let's hear the cats. Meow, meow, meow. <laughs> there we go. And then the old man was snoring. Okay. And the crowd burst into cheering. Yay! But then the villain came in and they booed. Boo! All of those, you know, we didn't have to teach you anything. It wasn't like a long prep. Just a chance to add in. And really, you can, besides in a Families for Literacy or in a group, you can do that really just one-on-one, -on -one, of making a deal is that this story has a lot of sound effects. Sound effects is a good teaching vocabulary. What the heck is a sound effect? Talking through about that, but then add a few in. Now, if you want to spend a tiny bit of money, I want to introduce you to my all-time favorite sound effect. If I said it was a dark and stormy night,
and then the lightning came. <laughs> okay, how cool is that? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Woo! Um, so this is actually called a thunder tube. Um, cost costs like 10 bucks, and I, I've got the, the box. You can look at the, the name and the internet website if you want that. But, you know, suddenly we're in a dark and stormy night, and it's just fun. Adds a little piece, gets, gets you kind of in the mood going on. So sound effects, really cool. We should use them more. Um, Want to also, here's, here's a piece with... Sometimes we have students who really are good artists, who are, you know, who are like those drawers. Some fine artists, and some are doodle artists. I'm kind of more of a doodle artist. I'm never, I'm never a fine artist. But storyboarding is one of those ways that, you know, often as we're working with people on comprehension, we're trying to get the... Um, the, the sequencing of understanding that stories have sequencing, trying to do some retelling. And for some people, they're, they're lost. Now, I, I have no idea what's going on. For many people, even getting the words is fine, but the comprehension is just like hard. So here's, uh, here's something that um, you might be able to do. This, this is actually from, it's from an old folk tale and it was put together in a picture book. It's called um, how the, how, Why the Tides Ebb and Flow. But I'm just going to show you a quick piece of, um, this, this is my original artwork, it's so beautiful. But I've done this with both groups and with individuals about we've either read or told the story and then we can retell it from these pictures, or you can have the learner do their own drawing. It's almost like making comic strips on a separate piece of paper. But I'll just show you, and which, which camera do you want me to, to have it? You're, you're okay there? Okay, so this, this story I will show you, you could do with, with a learner. And of course, every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And this story begins with once upon a time, there was a, if you're just going to look at that, who, who would you guess this was? Me. <laughs> no, but I mean, just, just take a guess. Uh, a sister. It could have been a, a sister. It could have been me. It could have been partly when we were showing illustrations to give a chance to have guesses and predictions. And uh, let me just do a, a little piece. I'm sure you guys all know this, but... If we're wanting to encourage people taking risk taking, we don't go, wrong answer. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> Anybody go, oh, no, no more answers. So, so taking guesses, could have been me, could have been a sister going on. This is, this is my rendition of an old woman. And you guys can't, can't see the pictures so well, so well, but it could have been me. Um, but she was an old woman. And she lived right next to, any guesses? A lake? An ocean, a beach. She, she did live actually by the ocean, but it could have been a lake. And she grew gardens. But she had a problem. Can you guess what her problem was? She had no house. Or, or, or she had no outhouse. That, that would be even a worse problem, I'm thinking. There we go. And so she decided to go ask for help from the most powerful thing she could think of. She went to ask for help from the sun. And she said to the sun, I need a house. I need a house. Could you have a house? But the sun answered, no. And she did that a couple of times. <laughs> and then she went to the sun and said, son, could you have, and I'm going to give you a hint because this is my drawing of a rock, <laughs> which you couldn't necessarily tell, but son, could I have a rock? And the sun said, yes. yes. Okay. You can see 
these do not have to be really good drawings, <laughs> which is lucky to be able to do that. But this is, this is a wonderful tool of just being able to work on comprehension. Again, low pressure. If, if you've told a story and you have these, or said, let's go through and we'll make our own little pictures. If you have a demonstration of something that is like kind of not really high level, really good. I, I, I've never had somebody look at it and go, I could never draw that well. <laughs> they go, see, there, that's fine. But, you know, there we go. This is, this is my whale. You know, eh. But the, this is not drawing class. This is literacy. This is like trying to work on words. Okay, so. Better than my whale. It is? Oh, see, then I feel a little better then. <laughs> so, but just, just to trust that in storyboarding that there's lots of lots of lots of different ways, but it just is another thing that hooks in with literacy, hooks in with storytelling to be able to walk through, get like, oh, I see. So if I tell or read the story, we go through this, then we go back and read it. It's getting a chance to come back through and it's like, sometimes you go, oh, it's starting to make some sense to me because I'm getting the input in different kind of ways. Okay, let's see. Um, number, number seven, you tell or read the story and have the learner tell it back to you or tell it, you know, share and pair again. Now, here's, here's a quick piece. When, when I was telling the Baby Coyote story early, it wasn't exactly fair because it wasn't a book you were familiar with, but just to let you know, when I'm talking about doing oral storytelling in this way, what I'm not talking about is memorized acting, where you memorize scripts and say things word for word. Who has a hard time memorizing things? Oh, suddenly I'm in the like, oh, this is gonna be really hard and if I say the word wrong. What we're talking about here, when we're talking about telling the evil Jessica stories, talking about, talking about if I asked you, whoa, what did your family do on vacation last summer? You don't have a memorized speech, you're just telling what happened. And that's what we're asking in terms of our, of our learners in doing retelling a story, we're not asking them to memorize and say the story exactly as we said it or as we read it to them because hardly anybody's got that kind of brain. You hear it, read it one way through, and you got that photographic memory, and you spit it back. But if I asked you to, and I'm, we don't have time, but, uh, but I could ask you to turn to your neighbor and quick tell them, what was that baby coyote story? What happened in it? We know it's got a beginning, stuff happened in the middle, what happened at the end? You probably could give, you know, a pretty decent version of it. And I will tell you, and, it, and if your learner's doing that and they're stuck on some part, they can ask for help or you can just go, oh, and what was that thing about the grandma? And go, oh, yeah, 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 the grandma. You know, she did this. So this is not like to make it hard. This is to make it easy and fun. And, and there's something that's cool about you, you've heard a story, you've told it to somebody, then we'll say, do you think you could go tell that to somebody at home? Could you tell that story that we read today to your kids? Because sometimes the fact is they couldn't read it yet to their kids, or their grandkids, or their neighbors, because some of the parts are too hard. But sometimes just to tell it, you don't even have to have all the parts. Maybe you forgot a part in the middle. Doesn't matter, how did it end? How did, how did it come out? So just to, to toss that in there as, as another piece, the retelling. Okay, we're gonna do a quick exercise. This is one of my all time, if I had a $100,000 idea for you that I love almost the most of anything, it is a button box. This is my grandma's button box, full of real genuine buttons. My grandma, anybody have a grandma who did this? Cut, cut buttons off of any piece of clothes, save them her whole entire life, never gonna go. 
Well, just to save us time, if I was doing this with a learner or with a class, I would actually pass around the button box because there's a good tactile piece in actually reaching into the actual box. And I'm going to give you a secret. If your grandma didn't have one of these, you can buy one of these <laughs> at any uh, Salvation Army or Goodwill. Got all kinds of weird old, you know, boxes with lids, just to let you know that. And Michael's sells mixed packages of buttons. You know, five bucks. Get yourself a grandma's button box. But this is your assignment. In, in just a second, I'll explain it to you. What I want you to do, on your table, you all have a plate of buttons out of my grandma's button box. I want you to quickly pick out a button. Just, this is not rocket science. Pick one that calls to you. Everybody, pass it and pick a button quick. Okay, once you have a button, and the directions say here, but I'm going to ask you to commune with your button for a minute. <laughs> to look at your button, and I want you to ask it three questions. Question number one, and this is, this is not in actuality. I'm not asking you to be a detective. I'm asking you to use your imagination. Look at that button. What piece of clothing did this button come off of? Once you know that, who did that clothing belong to? And how in the world did it come to be in your possession? What did it, did it come off of? Like I could look at this one and go, ooh, this looks like this came off of a, a ship's captain's coat. So that's the two. It was a coat and it belonged to the ship captain. And... It might have been um, a great, great uncle of mine who was a ship's captain, and he wore this when he sailed around the equator, and when he came back, he was celebrating so much, he cut all the buttons off of his coat and gave one to each of his nephews, and then they saved it, and one of those nephews was my father, and he gave me this button when I turned 18 years old. You go, wow, really? No, I just made that up. So I want you to extremely, I'm going to give you like literally one minute, ask that, and then we're going to, we're going to just get with the partner. But just whatever story your button wants to tell you, listen to it now. Go. Okay, so, so quick show of hands. Who is able to get some little piece of a story from your button? Okay. I want to tell you, I have done this with children as young as three, all the way up to seniors. Everybody always gets something. It's, this is again, I mean, uh, sometimes you're like, are you? I've had people like, I don't think my button has any. <laughs> but just to know, yeah, just, you know, again, there's a way in which it's hard to feel a huge pressure like there's a right story from a <laughs> pink flower button. You know, this is not a super high pressure kind of a thing to be able to do that. Now, I, I, I heard some of the pieces and some I couldn't hear, but I was watching. It was sort of very exciting. I, I would like to just, just um, share a few just because I think it, that there are some good things. So not that you think yours is the best story, but that you think your button had an interesting little piece to tell you. So yes, could you, could you stand up so we could do that, please? Thank you. And show us what your button looks like. This is a little gold button, a large gold button. This a button came from a casual woman's coat, casual woman's jacket, and uh, it belonged to a young woman. In fact, this woman was one of the people that I loved many years ago in a place far away. And 
the reason I have it is because when I proposed to her, she said no. And <laughs> as she turned away, somewhat in disgust that I would even ask her, I reached out and caught her jacket, Oops. and as she left, the only thing I have left to remember oh. <laughs> Touching story. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay, who else? Who else? Their button had something to say. Oh, okay. Yeah. Say. <laughs> this little button actually belonged to me when I was a young child. This little button was on a pinafore that I had to wear. You see, I lived in an orphanage for five years. And all of the girls in the orphanage wore these little pinafores. They had a button right here on the strap and right here on the other strap. Well, one exciting day, I got adopted. And I got to go home. And when I got to go home, I didn't know there were any other kind of clothes. I thought this is the only thing that we could ever wear. So my new mommy and daddy let me take my uniform home with me. And it's just a little piece of rag to this day. But I got to save the button. Oh. Oh. Excellent. That's good. Somebody, somebody else, either they had one or, or they heard a partner say one that was really? She had a good one. Jesse, yeah. That's okay. It. Can you stand? I can stand. <laughs> you can't see this. It's not really a button. It is a Halloween mask for a cockroach that lives in my garage. <laughs> <laughs> He's a good friend. I don't want him in the house. I'm happy. On the patio, it's okay. Come to the door. Not in the house. Anyway, he dressed up one year, and this was his fabulous costume. This was his mask and I admired it so much that he gave it to me when he was through with it. <laughs> and how about somebody from this side? Yeah, I, you, you, look, you had something good going on with yours. Could you stand please? More than one button. I have a, several buttons and my story is similar to your story. These came off uh, the dress that my mother made me for my very first day in school. And she made all of our clothes, so when I would outgrow a dress, she would take the buttons off. I mean, why, why give it away, right? Uh, the dress, just because the dress was too small or worn out. So when I got to be about in the sixth grade, I said, I don't want puffy sleeves and gathered skirts any, on my dresses anymore. I want store-bought clothes. <laughs> But I felt bad. I saved the last dress that she made with these buttons. Yeah. And eventually, I don't know what happened, but for some reason, I cut the buttons off. I think I started making doll clothes or something. Oh, anyway, that's sweet. my little button story. <laughs> yeah. So if we had time, we could actually probably stay around all afternoon and listen to Because aren't these great stories? And so I'll give you I'll give you a little a little hint with this. If if you wanted to do this, and especially like in a small group or families for literacy or something, there is something powerful about telling a story and then either telling it again or maybe telling it again to a different person. If you switched all around, telling a story a second time through more details come. Did the people who, who were sharing it, did you find, did you have any more details when, when you told it the second time through than when you told it? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. That's just something about the magic of making stories is, especially as you're getting a chance to say it out loud, sometimes more details come in. And so that's just like, cool. You're like, oh, and I just thought of another thing at that orphanage. <laughs> You know, there was this smell there. <laughs> so, there we go. So, which actually, parenthetically, just to throw in there, um, if people are having a hard time, you might encourage the five senses. Gives, you know, were there any smells? Were there any tastes? Was there anything to see? 
Um, you know, were there things to touch there? So sometimes when people are blocked, all of a sudden you, a you ask that question, they're like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. How do, you know, what, what fabric was this button from? And I will also tell you, I originally, when I, when I heard this exercise, I thought, okay, well, women will be way into it, but I'll never get a boys or men to do it. <laughs> no way! I get some of the most awesome stories from males about this, and males are, are even more likely to say, can I keep my button? <laughs> <laughs> Stick it all in there. And what, what I always say to my learners, and I always say to you, that if you're attached to this button and it was, you're so glad that it came back to you, that you're, you can keep it if it's, if it's important and precious to you. If, if it's served its time, you can you know, put, it, put it back in the box so that you can have other stories to be able to tell. But I've had a surprising number of like, I took it home and I put it in my special place and I told my kids the story and as they go on. So just to toss that in there, you can do this. Oh, then of course, anytime we're making up stories, we could write the stories down. You could, I mean, if your learner's at the place that they can write it themselves, they can dictate it to you, you can write it down. There is a great power of having a story that you wrote down in writing. Even these little, you know, little button story, all of a sudden, there it is. So just to know, you know, we can always write, write the stuff down, which makes it, and then you can maybe go on the computer and put it on the computer if, if they're working on computer skills or some piece like that. Okay, we're, we're zipping, zipping. I want to just make sure to at least touch on some of these other pieces. One of my other favorite things is a magic box. A magic box. Okay, people like magic boxes. People, this, I brought just one of my little, I had big, cool magic boxes and treasure chests and going on. This is, this is a little, little pencil box that, you know, it's like, um, every day find out something new about life, which I thought, well, that's a good literacy kind of one, but whatever kind of box. Here's a way to introduce new vocabulary. You take something, that, a vocabulary piece, out of the box and using pantomime, act it out, and the person has to try to figure it out. So if I reached in here, and I pulled out baby. Baby. Okay. Now, oh, wasn't like great acting. Oh man. <laughs> no, but I, I use that just as a simple thing. But sometimes when we're trying to get those new vocabulary and trying to figure out what the heck is it. Just a little, this, this becomes a little fun way to introduce. So you can do it, or you can have you know, a list of vocabulary you're doing and have your learner reach in the box and act it out. And you need to try to be the guesser as it goes on. Um, people, I, I've, I've had classes who that's what they want to do all week, every night. It's like, no, okay, we're going to do something else besides magic box. But there is something just about, you know, a little bit different to bring it out. And people want to know what's inside there. And so this, you know, you know, of course you can fill it full of props, but you can just like use your imagination with the props. Um, let me see. Number 10. A little acting um, exercise that I've that I've learned with learn used with learners when we're just working on different vocabulary is you have one phrase like "I'll do it," and then you're just using different feeling words. You're going to say "I'll do it" like you're excited. "I'll do it," uh, like you're angry. "I'll do it," um, like you're disappointed. I'll do it, um, like you're frightened. I'll do it. So again, just another way to be able to work vocabulary that's not like so boring. I hate boring ways to work on vocabulary. So toss that in. Um, seed or story starters. 
Number 11, just had a quick list, and then there, you know, we have another list, but I will tell you, asking somebody, tell us a story about a scar that you got on your body. Anybody got, anybody got a quick scar story? Let's hear it. When I was living in France, uh, we had a chance to go visit some friends who were also military dependents, and we played games, the boys and the girls, and one day we were playing with airplanes, and the airplanes were uh, Tinker Toys, and at the end of the Tinker Toys were bullet shells, and my, my young uh, female friend heated the bullet shells and was going, mm -hmm. And I got too close. And right here is a scar. This was fifth. Well, I won't tell you how long ago. <laughs> it was a long time ago, and I still had a large scar, about three inches by one inch, because of the being burned. Ooh. Okay. Suddenly, now I'm going to tell you if I just said, please stand and tell any old story you can think of. That gives me a big blank. I'm like, ah, I don't know. Oftentimes we ask our learners, write something, anything. <laughs> our brains work like, I, I don't know, that's too much. There's, there's too much things. So having a short prompt a something, there's a, you know, have you ever played a practical joke? Tell us about your name. We could also spend all day talking about name stories. Very, very cool, very interesting. How, do, how does that all come together? Um, I, I, I'm going to tell you um, one other sheet right here. But just to know, these are the sorts of things. Some people use it at, at just at the start of a tutoring session or class as an icebreaker, getting things going. But just like something to get, to get the brain moving there. Um, I want to, want to talk just for a second, because we're almost out of time, but chapter books give us some interesting ideas with storytelling. We did um, a number of years ago with, that I worked in the Ellie Project with the, the uh, state literacy, where we were working with children of English language learner families. And we, um, one of the things that we did in Escondido was chapter book Holes by Lewis Secker. Really excellent, great book for a, a lot of different levels. But there were a lot of concepts in there that both the kids and the parents were unfamiliar with. Uh, we acted some things out. We did a lot of stuff. But simple props here again, I just want to want to show you. These, these were boys who were sent out to be at a juvenile detention work camp. They were dressed in orange coveralls. Nobody knew what that was. Once we had G.I. Joe with his orange coveralls, they were so there. Everybody got it. Well, oh, that, those, you know, and be able to talk back and forth in different languages, like, oh, what that is. But I, I tried to explain it for forever, something about that. Also, we had canteens. I finally got, like, like water bottles, like, oh, but... I found a old Boy Scout canteen suddenly came to mind. They were also having to dig holes. And I finally went and I brought a shovel. I had many, particularly of these fourth and fifth grade kids say, is that a real shovel? <laughs> yes, it is a real shovel. But if you had never in your life held a real shovel, there were lots of parts of this story that made no sense. They were digging holes that were just about six feet deep. My learners had no idea we're talking. I made a portable hole. <laughs> Here you go. Okay. Here we had this hole. We would put it down to the ground. We would hold it up. How deep would that all? Suddenly... We had some context to talk about as opposed to how big is that as a whole like that? I don't know, this big no, <laughs> bigger. It's bigger. So just just to toss that in, I I sewed this also. Just to, you know, thank you, thank you. There we go. 
<laughs> so just, just to uh, know, you know, and, and I still have my real shovel. To, um, we, we will not have time to do this, but I just wanted to point out to you, I'm actually kind of proud of this. I, I developed in training um, tutors uh, the, the last handout you had there called What's Your Story and What's Your Learner Story? And this is a, a list of questions that can be asked of both yourself as a tutor or teacher and of your student or learner. And part of what is powerful in this, and the questions are things like, what was your family like growing up? Um, what was your experience in school? Have you ever tried to learn something that was really hard for you? I will tell you that's probably the number one best story as a tutor or a teacher you can tell your students. Students assume if you are a tutor or a teacher that everything has always been easy for you to learn, that you just automatically know how to do things in a, in a way that is so different from them. So I, as somebody who is a Spanish language learner, struggling, struggling, struggling in my Monday night Spanish class, I will tell you, it's very humbling to get back in touch with those things that are hard and that don't come easy. And other people are doing them easy. And you're like, voy a hablar más español pronto. <laughs> I am going to speak more Spanish soon. Oh man, did I work on that for a long time. So, but for learners to go, you know, maybe learning how to drive a car was hard for you, or playing a musical instrument. So, uh, one of our tutors tells us about learning how to swim was really hard for him. He struggled and struggled and almost drowned. Well, then you go, okay, Maybe you know a little bit about what it's like for me trying to learn how to read or trying to learn English. So again, this is probably like a four-hour conversation if you answered all of these questions back and forth. But I give you that just as an invitation of hear your learner stories and share your story with your learner because, as the little quote on the top there says, um, Isaac Dinesen said, to be a person is to have a story to tell. So we need to end and wrap up right now. Please fill out your evaluations on the form. Uh, if you want to come up and talk with me, uh, pick up uh, one of my cards or look at any of the cool stuff I have up here, you're welcome to do that. And thank you so much for your great attention today.